what so, are you guys working on? Uh, we just got done with your Club Edition MX-5. Okay. And uh, we had a few questions that we wanted to address instead of just going up and back in email. So I appreciate you taking the time to, you know, maybe you can help us, maybe you can't. So uh, the first thing that we actually we wanted to talk about was uh, we know that it, after looking at your outgoing 2015 and the 2016 that the rear end went away from ball joints in the rear end, all your individual links to just tip, you know your standard rubber bushing mount points. Uh, we, so we wanted just to understand why you went away from all the ball, the ball joints after all those years to the standard rubber bushings. Actually, they're some of them uh, have ball joints hidden inside of what looks like a bushing. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the, um, we're, we're setting up uh, a, a compliance sphere using uh, the, the different uh, various different bushing durometers and a couple of uh, uh, a couple of uh, rubber isolated uh, ball joints. Um, they're just packaged differently than what you saw on the old car. Uh, to give it a, uh, uh, a little bit of a toe in under compliance. Um, so the old uh, the old rear suspension had sort of uh, two contradictory strategies going on. It would toe out uh, with a side load on it, with, with the, the compliance steer, and then it would toe in under compression. So when you turn in, the first thing it would do is the rear would toe out and kind of throw it into the corner, and then the body would roll, and it would toe back in and stabilize it, um, which was good for making the, the car... Uh, but people were kind of, a lot of people just thought it took a weird kind of two-step set coming into a corner. Um, they were less comfortable with that. Um, and so the new car being so much lighter, we didn't really need that trickery to throw the rear tire, uh, the, the rear of the car into a corner. Um, so we did everything, the, the toes in uh, with the side load, and it toes in a little bit more with the uh, suspension compressors. Um, so everything's moving in the same direction, which makes a much more linear, uh, predictable uh, cornering response, uh, which ultimately is what makes a car front to drive. So okay. that was the strategy on, on the rear suspension. So the main point was is to change the links and some of the geometry to get rid of the, the towing out, the initial tow out that the old car had seen. Right, and that, that initial tow out on the old car was intentional. It was it was part of the strategy, but uh, you know we're we're always sort of rethinking and, and re-strategizing how, how to make the car front to drive. So okay. um, this, this time around, we, we figured that if we make the car light enough, the polar moment of the car, uh, the rotational inertia is like 10% uh, lower than it was before. So it's a much easier to get the car to, to rotate. Um, so we don't need we don't need an initial tow out the back to kind of keep the tail into a corner. Your club and your GT, in ter terms of the way the dampers and the spring rates are set up between the two, is it a substantial difference in terms of tuning, or is it just minor? Uh, you know, it depends on uh, it depends on who you talk to. Um, I I think it's fairly minor because I spent a lot of time in both, and and we actually got the GT handling better than we anticipated. Um, but uh, I've had a lot of people. You know, driving back to back and let's say it was a pretty uh, pretty substantial difference. We're limited uh, on how stiff we want to go um, by the convertible, uh, the by body structure of the car being a convertible. We, again, we don't, we want to stay away from where it will start shaking. Um, but uh, you know, the, the club has a little bit stiffer spring rate. Uh, those steam dampers that are you know tuned a little more uh, a little more aggressively. Uh, and it has a limited slip. Um, the sway bars ended up being the same. We actually played around with a little bit bigger rear sway bar and then didn't like the way that it changed uh, the limit behavior. It, it made it tend to, to break away really abruptly. So we ended up getting exactly the same handling balance by stiffening the rear springs instead. Um, but uh, the, the, the main difference, you know, the, the, the GT is more comfortable. It actually still handles remarkably well it's just a little bit slower to respond, like when you're when you're in a hard corner and you're using the throttle to steer the car a little bit. The response to the throttle inputs a little bit more slowly because it doesn't have a limited slip and because the damping's a little softer. Um, but uh, generally, it, it handles itself uh, surprisingly well for, for being the comfort car. 
Okay. I think that, yeah, that handles that. Do you, do, do, Scott, did you have any question about that? No. Okay. I think one of the biggest things that we noticed driving the car, and, I, I, you know, this is obviously subjective, highly subjective, obviously, for us, but uh, we've been in plenty of pretty much every Mazda car now at this point, and yeah. the infotainment is actually really good that you guys put out, but I think in terms of the implementation, uh, it's very much like the Mazda 3 or the Scion IA, where this thing is just sticks up so so much and it's so obtrusive in terms of where it, i mean it's a great place don't get me wrong it's a good place where you can see it line of sight but it is so high up in the dash compared to let's say you know your mazda 6 refresh that it's like you know we feel like looking at it and especially doing all the video around it and spending some time with it uh in the miata especially maybe not as much as the other cars in the miata it really sticks out like a sore thumb it's it's the point where like Scott just, you know, he was so aggravated by it there. And then of course, turning on at night because of the bugs, the system's good for the most part, but the implementation just seems like it needs some tweaks. And that's why we ask, can you just get rid of it completely? Especially if you're using it more as like a weekend performance car. Right, right. It's, it's very, it's a tricky um, packaging exercise that car, obviously. Um, you know, the, the reason it's not sunk into the dash at all is we want the dash to be as low as possible. If you go back to the to the original uh, one six first gen cars before we put an airbag on the passenger side, that car had the low, simple, real classic dash. And um, you know, ever since we had to put an airbag in there, the dash kind of grew. And and, and you, even the one point eight first gen were just a, a much bulkier, heavier feeling interior. Um, so that's you know why we took the glove box out of the front of there to make room for the airbag to be in there and still have the, the dash uh, down low. But that's also why we didn't want to bring the dash up around the screen. If the screen is up there, you know, for glance time uh, to be a, as close to your line of sight as possible without blocking your forward view. Right. And the, you know, the screen size is kind of fixed by the distance it is from your eyes and the size of the font that we need to use to, to, to have you recognize what's on the screen in the shortest possible time. So we didn't want to scale it down to fit the car because the actual physics of what you're doing, you know, the distance from your eyes is, is, a, is a potentially different. Um, so, you know, we don't want to sacrifice your glance time, especially now we're dealing with the potential for more glare from being in an open top car. Right. Um, so all the sort of the basic human factors that drove it to the, to the size and shape it was in the first place kind of forced it to stay that size. Um, so. Yeah, I think that, I, it, I think it's we. It's a very practical choice to, to have it there, um, get driven in there by other factors. And then, you know, whether you like it there or not, is, is a fully subjective. Right? It's a fair number of people um, are saying like, you feel like it's, you know, it's a minimalist sports car. We don't need all this crap. Um, and maybe you're right. We've, we've found uh, you know, that a system with these capabilities is getting to be basic sort of price of entry to buy a new car these days. Like, you expect any new car to be able to do all that stuff. And of course, you need a screen to be able to handle all the different interfaces, all the different things the car can the system's going to do. So we're sort of stuck uh, having to put that in there. Right. And, yeah. And I think we totally understand that. And I get the overall implementation. And one of the things that I, I really appreciate with the way you guys have done all your Mazda cars is these systems are standardized across all your models. Now it's, it's, you know, you don't have a one-off that's different than the other. So you get into yeah, one. You can't, you can't do that because it's just, you need, you need the scale uh, of, of your full model line to be able to, to develop the software and support it and keep it going and keep it updated as the phones keep changing. Yeah. Right, and you guys have done a yeah. You've done a really good job with that. I guess just it's not so much a functionality, it's not so much a software thing. It's more of, you know, the implementation of it on a such a you know really you're dealing with a one-off car here because of the dashboard yeah. design that you're talking about. That's low height. You're trying to go back to how you did it before, and you know, getting rid of the glove box to fit the the airbag in there. You went through so much effort to lower the dashboard, and then you got. You know, you have your parts bin navigation unit that you're just sticking on top of the dash, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of what you set out to do. So, I mean, in terms of implementation, right. you know, we get that it's hard to package all the stuff that you want to for a certain cost, but 
we just felt like there was got to be a better way to either be able to put that thing on a hinge to lower it down or offer, offer a delete kit, something that allows you without a motor, you know, we don't want a motor in there to low, raise and lower it like a luxury car, but some way to recess it back in the dash, you know, there's got to be a way to do it without just having it stuck up there like a Fisher Price toy. requires a hole that's big enough for it so then you have to raise the dash to make that hole because right behind it is the actual unit driving it you know there's there's a whole gin size thing hit that dash behind it that's all full of electronics already so i i, get, I totally get what you're saying it's it's just uh yeah it's, it's that's a tough puzzle to solve yeah that's what i was thinking some type of you know obviously you deal with the mechanics of that you get into somebody who's an engineer of mechanical hinges and stuff and you, you have trade-offs of that too but something to pivot it forward even like a closing of a laptop lid for example if you had that right. screen able to come down like a laptop and close in a very unique clever way you would get rid of the whole thing of this stuck up thing up there you know but i understand that's a lot more difficult than it sounds to do from a design standpoint but it, we're just putting it out there and same thing with the controller you know your central command controller is it has to be a certain height to be accessible you don't want it too recessed so you, you I'm sure you're drawing this line of how far do you put it down versus up and we definitely ran into an yeah, issue with you run it down farther it's fine for the knob but it makes the buttons hard to use right yeah uh, I, I mean I get it you know I'm, I'm just bringing up yeah. the, the issues that we had so I mean don't take it too personally yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think we beat that one into the ground. I only have like two more questions for you, and these should be a lot shorter. Sure. Um, Traffic's still not moving, so it makes no difference to me. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, the next thing that we had was, you know, we talked about how fun to drive this car was, and obviously it feels like you're going 100 miles an hour, even at 40 miles an hour. So it, it's right. it's not really the lack of you know, you're going to hear people complain about the lack of power, and that's not really what this question's about. But your 2 and your 2.5 liter are kind of your staple, and I'm sure you get this question a lot. How hard would it be to really just plug in your 2.5 in this car since it's, you know, in your Mazda really, 3? It'd be surprisingly hard. Really? Um, the, the Skyactiv engines are not, uh, not the traditional old-school family where they're all exactly the same engine we just punch different size holes in them um they're actually all scaled proportionally around a, a sort of an idealized combustion chamber dimension uh and so the 2.5 liter is physically a lot bigger than the two liter okay. the 1.5 liter that the car was actually designed for is physically a whole lot smaller so basically the car was designed around the tiny 1.5 and we shoehorned the two liter in that oh okay um, so the shoe horn's already been used. <laughs> I gotcha. And, uh, yeah, putting a, put a two and a half in there, it was going to be tough. Um, in, the, in the NC, uh, it's just slammed up. The two liter, the two three, the two five, they're all exactly the same size. The two five is maybe a half an inch taller, but that's the only, the only difference. Gotcha. Um, because that was the traditional, you know, sort of old world uh, engine family. But we've completely revolutionized the way we build engines now, um, and we don't have to do this uh, thing where you make them all the same and, and use you know whole single-purpose machinery to build them. Everything is built on CNC machines now, so we can we can build a mixed line of different sized engines without any penalty. Uh, so all new world. Okay, well, you answered that question. So the, the follow-up question to that, the two-liter obviously is, you know, your tried-and-true two-liter with some different tuning, you know, and all the, the exhaust manifold, your intake manifold, all that, the little things are different there. Obviously, this has been tuned for 93 octane. I'm assuming your high-octane fuel. Uh, you know, you've got a two-liter that's putting out 155 horsepower, which seems, uh, I mean, I don't really know how to put this, but you go back 10 years ago and you had... 1.6 liters making 100 horsepower per liter, or two, you know, two liters making 240 or 200. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, it, you focus, if you focus on peak power output, uh, it's way down. If you look at actually, the reason it doesn't feel slow when you're driving it, and the reason it's, you know, it's actually faster than a uh, BRG, which is 200 horsepower, two liter, that actually has a better power to weight ratio than the MX-5 still, because 
it turns out the peak power number at the single RPM that that power is generated at isn't everything. You've got to look at the whole the width of the power band and the whole area under the curve for the whole time you're going to be driving the car. Even if you are staying off the rev, the rev limiter at every single shift, you're still dropping down in the mid-range in between you know, every time you upshift. So all that mid-range still matters. And we put a lot of effort into a big fat mid-range in this car, so it has uh, the total average acceleration is actually you know, quite a bit better than that big number implies. Um, so that's that's where the focus has been on those engines is making uh, a quad power band instead of focusing on a peak number. Okay, well, um, that makes a lot of sense. Peak number, the peak number always wins the internet sites, <laughs> um, but that's not what the car's for. Right, yeah, and I totally understand it. Well, I'm not, you know, of course everybody's going to be a bench a bench racer uh, or spec it's, racer. It's, so. it's, it's a battle we have to continually fight. If we choose to make it, if we choose to engineer a car around how actually going to be driven uh and, and i'm not and i'm not saying that in that you know oh, you're always driving in traffic so who cares about higher rpm that's not the point the point is even when you are driving like a complete asshole like i do uh, <laughs> you're still going through the mid-range all the time the the, the mid-range response and, and the mid-range torque is really hugely important uh this thing just pulls out of the corner really well and it's, it's always got you're never waiting for it to come up on the cam um and so we've, you know, we've invited this debate because, you know, we know everybody just wants the analog numbers, uh, and we're, we're not, we're not playing that game. So now we have to explain ourselves constantly, and we have to just beg people to get in the car and drive it. If we could somehow keep the horsepower secret until after we both driven the car, we'd, we'd be gold. Yeah, and you drive the car, it's not slow. It's not, it's, you know, it's not a bitchy Camaro. Uh, but it's not a slow car uh, because it's got the right power delivery, it's got the right gearing, it's got the right weight. Uh, but uh, yeah, the number is totally unimpressive. Yeah, and I, I don't, I guess what I started to lead with the question with the 2.5 liter. Okay, so that's out. So you've already shoehorned the bigger yeah. 2 liter in here for the U.S. market. You have a motor, the 2 liter, that's making 155 horsepower, which is you know, you drive a Mazda 3 and you realize it's very similar, but the tuning is absolutely different. The gearing's absolutely different. It feels like a totally different motor. It feels, and, it, yeah, it feels totally different, doesn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, it feels great in the car. I guess here's the thing, right? We were talking about this and we drove it and we love it. You know, ev everybody that drives it really enjoys it. There's something visceral about it. Like you said, if you just threw the numbers away and just drove it, you'd really appreciate it. But you gotta wonder how much really, how much overhead is there to do more? I mean, you, you're gonna have this enthusiast crowd or a crowd that looks at this car, and obviously you don't really have any competition, so that's not particularly fair. But you look at this car and you just want more in some cases. And I think there's this, you know, you got a four banger that's really solid in there that that seems like you could do more with it. But I don't, I don't, I guess that's my question is, is there overhead on the two liter to do more? Do you guys plan to do more? Are you just happy with kind of keeping it where you're at? I, I certainly think there is more. I don't honestly know. Um, you know, the, the way the engine development process happens internally, you don't, you don't get to see, you know, what would it do if we, if we opened up the, you know, changed the cams and then, yeah, did all this stuff. So. Um, I know there isn't uh, there isn't a lot in in the basic simple stupid bolt-ons like we didn't up the intake system and make the air filter too small or anything like that you know right yeah it's it designed designed efficiently as a system but that said it was designed around uh, you know fuel economy emissions targets as well and, and if you are uh, if, if you throw those out the window in the right way um, I think there's a good there's a good chance that there's that there's more in there, but uh, um, we haven't really done much motorsport development on that engine yet. And the, the, the main our main effort in, in racing that engine is is in the uh, in the spec series, so um, we just want to make sure they're all the same. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, yeah, I definitely so understand. I, I'm I'm expecting there will be because I see a lot, a lot of really good tuners jumping on that car right now, so I think they're gonna find. Uh, that we had on the table, you know, not having a whole lot of 
budget to throw at, at engine development. We basically had to carry over an existing uh, engine in this car. There was an option to do a 14 to 1 compression engine, which is what we sell in Europe and Japan. Um, and I think the fact that we stuck with 13 to 1 actually gives more headroom for, for playing around with it because um, uh, uh, there's, if you're going to increase solar pressure, through some means, whether it's making it breathe better or or, uh, or putting some boost on it, you want to have that little bit of you know, knock resistance headroom that, that we would have eaten up with 14 to 1. We probably could have actually delivered a couple more horsepower if we did 14 to 1, but I don't think we would have had the same sharpness of the throttle response. It would be so much closer to that bracket edge on the knock limit. Um, and I think that 13 to 1 ended up being better, both for the drivability uh, of the car out of the box and for giving a little headroom to tears. Okay. Yeah, I think you answered that perfectly. I, I don't really I don't really think there's any room for tearing into it anymore. Uh, the last question is even more simple than that. Are you guys going to have your are you guys going to have the Recaro options for the uh, GT or the Club Edition anytime in the U.S. And are you going to offer the Bilstein and the LSD setup on the GT pack at any point, or are you just kind of sticking with what you're doing? Uh, we've got a lot of people uh, asking about the bill scene on the GT, um, so we're we're trying to figure out um, you know, we're trying to figure out how many of those people are serious and and why and what what, is, what combination of stuff they're actually wanting um, because you know we did the the GT and club strategy intentionally because we think that there were a lot of people previously who were buying GTs that were getting the suspension package they didn't actually want. They just you know, wanted the most. And the suspension package isn't the most. It rides worse than the GT. And if that's what matters to you, you're not getting what you want. It handles better. And if that's what you want, then great. Um, so it's a question of what do people really want out of the GT? Because we just put that option out there. The dealers are just going to option it up to put, put a bigger, thicker price on it. And that's what you're going to be stuck with. Right. Um, that's kind of what was happening on the NC. So we did the GT sort of targeting a, a different customer. Because we see distinctly different customers buying the car. We see, you know, hardcore enthusiasts buying the cars, what the club was for. We see people who just want a cute convertible. That's what we sort of made the, the base sport model for. Uh, and we see guys who are kind of making this thing into like a, 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 a lightweight, you know, SLK kind of thing, a more of a premium, you know, reward car. And uh, I don't think those, those guys necessarily want to put up with some of the ride uh, implications of the sports suspension. So if people are wanting a GT with a sports suspension, we need to figure out why. And do they just want a club with leather seats? Or do they want the lane departure warning system that comes on the GT? What is, what is it that people really want from that? We'll, we'll, if we, once we can figure that out, we'll do it. Okay. Uh, we just need to figure out what it is. What are people actually asking for when they say that? Okay. Because you know, the GT has. Do they want the shiny part in the middle of the vent that the GT has? Or, <laughs> right. Yeah. Or what actually is it about the GT? I suspect it's the leather seats with seat heaters because that's a damn nice thing to have in a roadster. Um, and, and and if that's the case, maybe what we should do is have a, an optional leather seat on the club instead. Okay. I don't know. Um, on the Recaro, we're, we're looking at it. Um, we're, uh, we actually haven't had any of the Recaros in the U.S. to put our big American bus in yet. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. uh, we're still trying to, get, we're trying to get those over here to, to actually, you know, get it past the first test of do they fit right. Um, and, uh, and then it's, a, again, a balancing act of, you know, how much do they cost and what do we package them with. But uh, we're... Where uh, I can I can give you a good solid probably on that. Okay. And I'm assuming that if, if, if they feel like they're gonna work right, then yes, we'll do it. Gotcha. And I'm assuming the hard top's the same story. That's probably something that's in development or or a removable hard top option or something like that. Well, you know the removable hard top we had on the NC. Um, have you ever seen one? I have never seen one. Out here. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> really good. I've, I've seen one of them in the wild. Um, I think thousands of them are sitting in a warehouse somewhere. Uh, so that, that's that's kind of what we're dealing with 
but there yeah, we're we're maybe we're looking at maybe a motorsport one and trying to figure out if the if motorsport hardtop should come with window seals and stuff like that to actually be used on the street or not. You know, we're 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 juggling different ideas, trying to see what 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 the best uh, option is. But the reason we don't have a removable hardtop of the thing out of the out of the box is uh, is that we did that on the NC and nobody wanted it. Okay. Yeah, it's probably the reason why I, I see the question is because there's no power retractable hardtop. So people are like, well, if we don't have that, can we get the, you know, the removable? I think that's the only right, reason right. I'm, I'm seeing that question. So Probably, yeah. All right. Or, I, or, maybe, or maybe, you know, we've also found that the, the removable hardtops have become extremely popular on the first and second gen cars. And it could be that we're, we're attracting, you know, a lot of people who like the NAs and MVs didn't like the NCs, and so we're we're getting you know back to our base customer who does want that hardtop. So maybe we're just attracting different people, and, and the NC sales data maybe isn't isn't actually the right stuff to look at.